Freddy? <laughs> hey, Jesse, just in time. Oh, we're hot. Okay. There you go. All right. Well, thank you guys for being here tonight. The room gets fuller and fuller, and we do not have to be afraid. We can pray. We can trust. If God is telling you to wear a mask, wear a mask. If God is telling you to get the vaccine, get the vaccine. If God's not telling you those things, or if you're afraid of everything, you need to be talking to God more. Yeah. All right? And I say it that way because we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we have to be tapped into the source. Otherwise, the ruler of this world wants us to live in fear. And that's what he wants to do. And we don't, we're, we're not of this world. We're attached to the kingdom of God. And he's the one who actually is control of our lives. And I say this, not just for you, but for me, because I need to remind myself of that sometimes, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so, and anybody who's gonna watch this video later, uh, we thank you for joining us in the video format. And we thank you for being a part of us. Um, Let's pray, but before I pray, we're in Matthew chapter 2, all right? And uh, we will be picking up in the 13th verse. Okay, so let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, the name above all names, I thank you for what you're going to teach us tonight and what you're gonna show us and all that you're going to reveal to us, whether it be little or huge. Father, what I love about you is you speak to me where I'm at. And if I need huge, you give me huge. And if I need little, you show me little. Either way, you're completely involved. And I thank you for that. Thank you for loving us and using us for your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right. Okay. Now, I want you guys to come closer. Okay? Yeah. Hey, how old is... Uh... Okay. Hey, you're more than welcome to stay here with us or go with Austin. Okay. All right. Thanks, Austin. All right. Very good. Okay, did you guys catch that? Matthew chapter 2? Yep. All right. Okay, so... Uh, one of the reasons that in our Bible studies every year, uh, except for the two years or the year and a half that it took us to go through Psalms... <laughs> Um, right? Uh, and can you get enough of the Psalms? Right? I mean, they speak to everyday life. It's as if David wrote them yesterday. And uh, he was watching everything politically going on and, and was living in our shoes. That's the way I see the Psalms. Um, but I like to at least once every other year on a Wednesday night, I like for us to go through a gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And the reason is, is because we get to reading all that the disciples did so much, we need a reminder of why we believe what we believe, right? In fact, it's the foundation. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the foundation to everything that we study in the Bible, if you stop and think about it. Gospel is shared through uh, the manifestation of Jesus uh, as the Son of God and the Messiah and the Redeemer of the world. And so, uh, so one of the things that's fascinating, and I got into this a couple of weeks ago when we first introduced Matthew. Um, for those of you who don't know, I teach the Bible 
almost from a history and cultural perspective first. And then I get into the spiritual of it. It is all three things. Okay, this is a history book. It is a cultural book. It is a spiritual book. And it is God's word to us. And on every level, he can speak to us in it. And I'm going to get into some history tonight, just like we got into some last week and the week before. And the reason history is important is if we don't know our history or we erase it, we are destined to repeat it. One of the things I don't like about what uh, some of the movements that have gone on in the last year and a half and them trying to wipe out history, they do not realize in the lunacy of it, they're destined to repeat it. So if, if we're going to pretend like slavery never happened, guess what's going to happen? Slavery is going to happen again, only it'll be a different group, right? And just to set the record straight on that, every ethnicity in the world has been enslaved at one time or another. So I'm a history guy. I believe history. And by the way, history is his story or the story that God is telling us. And I say the mystery in the history is my story interjected into history. So, and that's a play on uh, redneck English. So, so here we are. The visitors come from the east in chapter 2, and they follow a star. The consensus that I led us to in this is that these three kings from, as the King James says, from the Orient is actually not the Orient as we know it. It is probably Iran. It's probably Persia. And the reason is, is because the King James Bible calls them Magi or Magi. That is only written one place in history and it's in Persian history. It's the only time that word is used. Okay? So they must be Persian <laughs> if it's a Persian word. Okay. So, and uh, so we see the kings come in, but more than that, we see Herod, the king of Israel, we see him upset over finding out there's a new king being born, and that king is, be, is Jesus, all right? Now, once again, I reiterated this. When you're reading and studying the Bible, you have to remember there are certain titles given to people at different times, and you have to realize, you have to put that in context. Let me ask you a question. When I say President of the United States, who am I talking about? The current president. What if there are seven alive and I say the President of the United States? Who am I talking about? All seven of them. Or the current, if it's in context, the current one that's leading because my conversation is about what's going on currently. But if I say Tell me the President of the United States' name, not the one serving. What are you going to do? You're going to have to name the ones that are alive. See how confusing that gets? Right off the bat. Well, guess what? It's no different with Matthew chapter 2. So let's get into it. So the wise men come. They tell Herod that a new king's being born. And then they get a message from an angel and they go back home by a different route. Herod finds it out and he is hacked because they were supposed to come tell him where this new king was being born. And then guess what Herod was going to do? Kill him because Herod is a jealous king. Uh, and let me, let me explain this. This is the irony of the Herods. Herods are Edomites. Does anybody remember what an Edomite is? Ah, very good. Esau's offspring. Who's Esau? Esau and Jacob. It's Jacob's brother. Now, what do we know about Esau? 
Esau was in the lineage of Abraham, right? And Esau did what with his birthright? Gave it away for food. In other words, he didn't think much of it. At the same time, Jacob, who later becomes Israel, tricks him out of it at the same time. Now, if Israel is being ruled by an Edomite, what does that tell you? It's not good. Because God put His blessing on Jacob, who later becomes Israel. What is an Edomite doing ruling Israelites? Right? Two things going on there. It's punishment from God for them worshiping idols and causing the law to become an idol. Okay? Number two, it's part of the system set up by the Roman government who, by the way, only can get the authority they get if God allows it, right? And what do the Romans do? The Romans come into a land, they conquer it. They don't kill everybody. They come in and they kill key people until everybody goes, wait a minute, we, what do we do? And they go, do you surrender? Yeah, we surrender. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put a person in charge of you, and that person is going to tax you, and then they're going to give half of that tax to Rome. But anybody get out of line here, all this person, this king that we set up, all he has to do is call us, we'll come in with the legion, and we will wipe you out if you don't stay straight. That's the way the Romans ruled, right? And they were good at it. Uh, their uh, Roman Empire lasted, what was it, 700 to 900 years? You don't last that long unless you're really good at it, okay? All right, so the Herods, were set up by the Romans and just to get the Jews right where they wanted them to because the Jews were an unruly group of people and what that means is when we hear the word unruly we think rebellious Jews weren't rebellious they didn't want to be ruled by anybody but God and so unruly in this case means they didn't want to call Caesar their king now uh, we find out about the time that Jesus starts His earthly ministry and starts calling God His Daddy, which really hacks the Jewish leaders off. All of a sudden, they look like they're best friends with Caesar. Right? So, I want you to see that. But let's get into this. All right, verse 13. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother. The angel said, Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Watch this. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother. And they stayed there until Herod's death. Now, I think it's fascinating that Joseph is a man who's accepted the fact that his wife is pregnant by somebody else. Just look at that in and of itself, all by itself. Isn't that amazing? What kind of character does Joseph have? A great bit of character. Of course, then an angel appears to him in a dream and says, Joseph, take, your, take Mary as your wife, and by the way, the Holy Spirit has come on her. The Holy Spirit, part of God, has made her pregnant. So you don't need to think, it doesn't say this, but it infers it. So don't think that she's cheated on you. She has done nothing wrong. Okay? And so Joseph, because this angel appeared, it's interesting because all of a sudden you see Joseph have this obedience towards God that is a whole nother level. Did you notice it says the angel appeared and told Joseph to get up and flee? Did Joseph dilly-dally? <laughs> Did Joseph go, wait a minute, are you the angel that was here earlier? He didn't question nothing. He got up, woke Mary up, and off they went. Now, I think that's interesting. Uh, when you look at it from an application point of view, if you feel like you have a really good relationship with God, you've been studying your Bible, or at least reading it, and you're talking to Him on a regular basis, and all of a sudden you hear Him say, Jim, I need you to do this. If we're where we need to be, 
we don't even argue. We don't give our reason for not doing it. We just do it. I'll give you a prime example. I told this story to, to somebody today. What is today? Today is Wednesday. I went to my oncologist today who said, one more test in three months and I'll let you go. Isn't that cool? Amen. Yeah. But check this out. Yes. Well, I mean, you know. <laughs> I, I, let me put it this way. He said it's okay to get my port out. What does that tell you? He's letting me go. All right. So I told this story three times in the last two days. Okay. Some people go, why do you think God allowed you to get cancer? Why do you feel like God told you to take chemo when you said you would never take it? And why did you take it if you don't believe in it? It's because God told me to. Now, here's the crazy part. Two things happened while I was going to get infused with chemo that I can just tell you in a short story. There was a hundred things happened, but two things happened. One, the first day, well, it's about the third time I went for radiation and chemo. I have a nurse friend that works there that I've been friends with for 25 years. And Michelle and I just love her. She is, she is like Nevaeh. She is this bubbly, and she works in the oncology department. But you know what? You need somebody bubbly in there occasionally because it can get really down and depressing, right? Anyway, she says, Jim, it's good to see you today. And there was 40 people in the room. And she says, good to see you today. And I said, good to see you. And she said, what'd you preach on Sunday? I said, really? And she said it that loud in front of all 40 people who didn't know I was a preacher. And they all went <laughs> like that. And I went, oh, dang. I said, you mean like a summary? She says, you got two minutes. <laughs> so I gave my sermon in two minutes. Yeah, and I just accepted it, right? The challenge. I gave that little sermonette in two minutes, and it was about hope in Jesus. What? That's the sermon that I preached the Sunday before that now God has told her to ask me what it was when I'm in a room full of people who feel hopeless? That's not a coincidence, right? Three days later, I'm there, and I'm feeling bad. The radiation, the chemo just, you know, just make you... That thing like when you get up in the morning and you've got a taste in your mouth and you can't get rid of it, it was like that. And I wasn't feeling good. I wasn't really into it or nothing. And I plopped down in a chair and Michelle goes, I'll go fill your paperwork out. And all of a sudden I looked up at the door. I was sitting opposite of the door and in come through the door a woman who had had a double mastectomy. She had all these bags and drain tubes hanging off of her. She was bent over, she was probably 70 years old, and she looked awful. And my heart was, had compassion like crazy for her. And I'm looking at her coming in the door, and she's walking in hopeless. You know, this is the end. That's what was on her. And I literally heard God say, I want you to pray for her. I said, okay. And I just kind of did this, and he goes, I want you to look her in the eyes and pray for her. God, I don't know her. Maybe she won't let me. He said, look her in the eyes and pray for her. I said, okay. So she sat down right across from me. And I said, "Hun, is this your first day? She said, yes. I said, God told me to pray for you. Would that be okay? And she said, why should I let you pray for me? I said, because God has me in here to minister to you right now. I said, I have a port too. I know what it is to go through what you're going through. I've had surgeries myself. I understand. 
and then she put her hands in her head like her hand her head in her hands like this and I scooted my chair right up next to her and I raised her face up and I said Jesus loves you and so do I I'm gonna pray for you and I want you to look me in the eyes and she said you don't know what I've done and I said if God's telling me to pray for you he knows everything that you've done and he's still reaching out to you right now and then I prayed and she cried and I cried and she cried and I cried <laughs> right how are you not gonna cry in that situation right and literally I walked out of there and I went it was all for this wasn't it see we forget that sometimes when we go through hard things it can be for one thing or it can be for a thousand things but God is going to use you the key is are we listening and do we do it when he says to do it right so let's go back to it get up flee to Egypt with the child and his mother the angel said stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him that night Joseph left for Egypt with the child and his mother Mary and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, I called my son out of Egypt. Here we go. Here's like the third prophecy fulfilled, right, in like a week. Actually, it was about the fifth prophecy. And you're just like, wow. But Joseph didn't question. He just did it. And a lot of people go, why did, why did uh, the wise men give them gold, frankincense, and myrrh? How do you think they could, uh, a carpenter who's camped out in Bethlehem, how do you think a person who works day labor is going to afford to go to Egypt and live there? Gold. That's how. Look at how God supplied their needs <laughs> with these guys from Persia right I mean it's ridiculous all right so verse 16 Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him he sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under based on the wise men's report of the stars first appearance Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken throughout the prophet Jeremiah a cry was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. By the way, when, Abraham, when uh, Jacob married Rachel, remember? She died in and around Ephraim where the land that was around that area was called Ramah. And if you don't see that in prophecy, you go, wait a minute, I thought she died... I thought she died in Ephraim. Well, you know what Ephraim is? And you know what an Ephraimith, Ephraimithite is? A Bethlehemite is the same thing. And when you start studying geography, you realize this is all the same spot. Bethlehem, uh, Ephraim, uh, Rama are all the same exact place. But you stack them over what over 900 years bing 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 and you realize it's all the same place so a lot of times when people will say oh the bible contradicts itself see it doesn't say bethlehem dude the bible this part this part of the bible is covering prophecy that is over 900 years old we just went through the 911 thing a few years back right and what did they do they renamed every road around ardmore and people who had been here their whole life now can't get around because they can't tell people how to get anywhere because all the roads have been renamed. Yep. Right? How is that any different than here? See? There will be a day in the future. Well, there was a day a long time ago in 1889 that Ardmore became Ardmore. Before that, it was called something else. Right? Gene Autry used to be called Berwyn right somebody came along with a great idea and they renamed it well if you're a Berwin a Berwinite right 
and now you're a genotriite, you're actually the same thing. Same thing here, okay? All right. And I'm showing you that because critics of the Bible who will say it contradicts itself have never read it and they've sure never studied it, okay? One of the reasons I show you the history is you can't argue with history, okay? Especially if it's written down. And this is written down, check this out, Roman history intersects this, Jewish history intersects this, and Herodian history intersects this. And when you read all three of them, they say the exact same thing. So that's history on steroids. You can't argue with that. All right? Okay, so... Uh, do what? Yeah, a voice was heard in Rama, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. And it's actually where Rachel died, but the prophecy was that her children, her offspring, would die there. Well, 900 years later, they did, but they were called Bethlehemites, <laughs> or Ephraimites, or Ramaites. You see it? Same place. All right, so now notice that Herod has been mentioned here in chapter 2 four or five times. Now this is interesting. Which Herod is this? It's according to which history you're going to believe. When A.D. and B.C. were originally set up as time sequences backwards and forward from Jesus' birth that was that transpired in the third century AD by a monk who had great influence and the Catholic Church was trying to form in and around that time and this guy had great influence and within his lifetime which was about 60 years he convinced the world to go to a time frame that was BC and AD before Christ and after Christ after Christ, which is actually A.D., A.D. but it's, it's Latin, yeah. Anyway, so here's the thing. When I get into this now, I want you to understand. In the third century A.D., these cats had access, especially the monks, they had access to every literary work in the world through Alexandria, Egypt. It was known as the place with the information, okay? Now, since we've gotten into scholarship in the 20th century and now the 21st century, we think we're so stinking smart, now we're messing with it. And now we call it BCE and CEA. And it's like, Come on. And so now in the BCA, they're saying Jesus was born in 4 BCA. Not 0, 4. And when you begin to read that, it gets complicated because there's four possible years that Jesus was actually born. Why is it that we don't know? Because he was a peasant, right? Have you ever met, uh, have you seen some of these people, uh, there was somebody, uh, a black woman the other day turned 110, right? She has no birth certificate. How do you know she's 110? Because she can tell stories that were 100 years old. First person. Yes, but the point is, it's still around that God number, which is 120. He said man will no longer live past 120. And you got people live a little older than that, a little younger than that. Either way, they span a century, okay? My point to that is, um, do what? Yes, which Herod they're talking about. Okay, if, if Jesus was born in four BC, then Herod the Great was trying to kill him. If he's born in zero, Herod, uh, 
Herod Archelaus was trying to kill him. And if Herod Archelaus, if they didn't come back from Egypt until Jesus was about six and zero was when he was born, then Herod Antipas was trying to kill him. Now, here's the point to that. Herod the Great had three sons, Antipas, Archelaus, and Philip. Right. Now, here's the reason I point this out. So what does it say in Scripture? Because Scripture, I believe, tells you the truth. Ready? When Herod died, an angel of the Lord, verse 19, appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said, take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel, because those who were trying to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son Arch Archelaus, or Archelaus, he was afraid to go there. All right, so what does that tell us? When was he born? See? So he was, he was born the the three kings from Persia get there sometime around the time that Jesus is either a year and ten months to two years. Why do we know that? Because Herod killed children from two years old and under according to the appearance of the star. So we know he was somewhere around two years old when he fled to Egypt. But when he came back, was it immediate or was it three, four years? We don't know, but what we do know is, this is what we know. You ready? Okay. Well, shoot. Here we go. Archelaus died in 6 CE, or ACE. All right? So, Archelaus was alive here. Now, the reason Archelaus was alive, it looks like Antipas killed him. And then Antipas kills under John the Baptist time. Antipas kills Philip and marries Herodias, which is Philip's wife. Would you read John chapter 3, verse 1? Luke chapter 3, verse 1. Sorry. He was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor. Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee. His brother Philip was ruler over. Can't pronounce that or that. Can't say that. Was the ruler over. <laughs> okay, the two places that he mentions that uh, Philip rules are north of Israel and east of Israel. Okay, they were Roman provinces. And they weren't technically part of Israel, okay? But in that time, they were part of Israel. Okay, why did I point you to that? Because when you stack the four Gospels over the top of one another and you read them almost simultaneously, you discover all the history you need to know is right there. Exactly. Now, why does he go to Galilee? Okay. Now, if here's what gets fun. I'm a map guy, right? I love that the Bible has maps. And if you want to understand what's going on at the time, these maps come in very handy. The map on the very back of my Bible is the map of the time of the ministry of Jesus. And it shows... Galilee, Upper Galilee, Lower Galilee, Samaria, Decapolis, Judea, and Perea, Nabatea, and Edomia. Okay? These are all regions of, oh, so it shows Tyre and Galenatus. All right. And this is the way I do names. We don't speak Hebrew. If you don't speak Hebrew, you're not going to say them right. So just say something and stick with it. Right? Okay. All right. And, and if somebody corrects you, say, can you say it in Hebrew? And they say, no, they say, then back off. <laughs> All right. 
Okay, look at where Mount Tabor is in conjunction to Nazareth, and they will be to the southwest of the Sea of Galilee. Can you see that? Anybody with maps? Ah, see, that's where the phones don't come in handy. But I'm glad you got them and you're looking and you're reading your word on your phone. Okay? All right. Okay.